from Byron, Mississippi. It's Lakeshore Church. And um, I just want you to know, it's a Genesis issue. That, that shame came about because of sin. And, and God's whole idea and whole thing that he did was to create an environment where you and I could deal with the shame of sin in our life. And we could be made right with God. So uh, we're going to do that. So if you're able, would you stand with us in honor of God's word? Genesis chapter 2, verse number 25. We're going to read this and uh, then we're going to pray and you can be seated. All right. Verse number 25, we find this. Both the man and his wife were naked, yet felt no shame. Both the man and his wife, Adam and Eve, were naked, and they felt no shame. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity, God, to stand publicly and do what you called us to do. Uh, Lord, I ask that uh, my words would be yours and my thoughts would be yours, and most of all, we'd walk in obedience to what occurs today. And as we've already said, I pray for that one today that they just have something the enemy likes to drag up. May they, may they know with clarity today that that's not you. If there's an issue there, you want to deal with it and you want us to, as somebody said, admit it, quit it, and forget it. And let's move on from there. But God, I give you praise and glory for what you're going to do in our time together. The remaining part here, Lord, we'll praise you now and forevermore for we ask you to pray it in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen, amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Uh, quickly, as you're settling in, we've got a list that's gotten pretty big. This is the 10th one. There's nine on the, uh, here on the screen. Uh, there's a lot of things that we've, we've taken up. I uh, appreciate all the comments. Uh, I'm glad they're held. I'm glad we record. I'm glad the things are out there. Someone say, I didn't get that one and go back and look at it, that kind of thing. But uh, there really is a pretty good, I, I never had seen this, pretty good progression. I haven't mentioned that word in a couple of, uh, of weeks, but there's a pretty good progression of these issues. And uh, this one notwithstanding, all of a sudden we sort of change gears here, if you will. Uh, with Adam and Eve, uh, it simply states in the text that they were naked. We have no concept of, of that kind of world. Uh, you, you'd call the law if you saw somebody like that. But they were naked and they felt no shame. It, it's really unique. Um, today we are going to take a look at the first couple, if you will, the first family the, uh, as they're in their relationship with each other. I could, I could preach for a month on, uh, on sex, no doubt in my mind. The, the things today, I, I tell folks, I, I've always liked the spring and, the, and the, the summers, you know, probably my third favorite time. I like the spring and the fall as far as the weather. And I looked on the next 10 days, it's supposed to be great in Mississippi and not as much rain. It's supposed to, the temperature's supposed to be great. I, I love the spring and the fall, of course, for temperature's sake. Um, the summer, it gets a little bit much. But I've gotten older, I, I, like, I like the winter. And the reason I like winter is because people put more clothes on. And I'm just being frank with you. I, I see stuff today that, I, you know, sometimes I see people wearing clothes and I go, I hope that was on half price because they only got half the clothes on. <laughs> but it's one of those things. Um, I could speak for a month on the social dynamics and demise that go with sex and sexuality and how all that stuff's portrayed in our world today. And, and it, it, it's just unbelievable. Uh, I won't spend a month on it today. But today what's on my heart, and really I feel like the Lord has moved on my heart about, is the shame part, that they had no shame. Now we're going to mention nakedness, of course, but uh, they had no shame. Look, maybe a little lighter, but some things that have some depth and weight to them is, have you ever thought about the first family? Ever thought about Adam and Eve? <laughs> You know, think about what was different about them versus everybody else is the, the first one is they didn't have any umbilical cords, <laughs> okay? No navel, no, no uh, having to cut that thing, you know? Um, I, I, I was asked if I wanted to do that, and I said, no, I'll pass. They didn't have any parents. I'm sure there's some teenagers here, maybe even young adults, maybe even some older adults that, that it's not good when you think about parents are still in the middle of it. Maybe that was a pretty good thing. <laughs> Secondly, they didn't have a past. And what I mean by that is Adam couldn't look at Eve and go, Mama never cooked it that way before. <laughs> hey, maybe Eve could look at Adam and go, all my exes live in Texas, but I don't know. They didn't have a past. That's pretty neat. They didn't have a past. We, listen, wouldn't that be great if we could just sort of you know, deal with our past once and for all. I mean, so many people can't be, they can't function in the present because of their past. 
Well, I'll tell you this. We have an altar in front of you today so you can deal with the past. I believe God wants to move you to the present. Amen? So you can affect the future in a positive way. Let me give you one more. They didn't have anybody to run to. Mm. I talked about apron strings last week. Many times people can't function in their own relationships because they're running someone else. Let me tell you one more thing. You know, the scripture tells me that if, if something goes on, I need to go to the person that, that's the, the issue and to God, and that's it. You know what we do? We run to everybody else in, in times, and we share it, and we got, a, we got a thought, we have an opinion, and we got all kind of junk we're talking, and we never go to the source, and we never go to God with it. That's good preaching. Not one person said amen. I guess we're going to have an altar call in the middle of my sermon today. Is that not the truth? We run our mouth, everybody. I always tell people, yes, there's a beauty shop, but there's a barber shop too. We all got our best buddy to tell. Don't tell anybody. I'm just going to tell you this. And then they got their best buddy. And before long, we best buddied it all over town. They didn't have anybody to talk to except themselves. That's pretty good. And God. Is that not good? Can you imagine how it was in a place like this with no shame? <laughs> I can't. A place that they didn't have that and probably 10 more that you could come up with. But I'm also reminded that this place of no shame, that's what we're shooting for in heaven. Heaven's going to be a place of no shame, folks. It's gonna be good. When I think about no shame and, or just naked, that word comes up. I, I don't know. It sounds sort of bad to say this publicly as a pastor sitting on the platform of the church. But I just like saying the word naked every now and then. But no shame. Made some of you laugh. Some of you are beyond it. But anyway. Adam and Eve, think about this. When I think about them, the first thing that comes to mind, they had nothing in the beginning. At the beginning, there was nothing, no comparisons. I've already alluded to that. I already established that. Because they had no comparisons, whether it was person, place, or thing, they had no shame. They had no taboos. They didn't have any issues that they were bringing their past to the present. They had no discovery. It wasn't, oh, so whatever. They had nothing. The slate was clean. Their appetites were holy and wholesome. <laughs> they didn't have a fad or a fashion like we do today. They didn't have to make a statement to someone else. They didn't have any expectations that someone else had put on them. <laughs> I don't know about you, but listen, they were just naked. I'll say that one more time. Are you, are you like me? I, I've gotten old enough where, you know, I used to think you went to the doctor because you were sick. You follow me? You don't feel well. You, you got a runny nose. There's something going on with your, with your abdomen. You don't feel good. You got to go to the doctor. Something, you know, is not working right or whatever. I've gotten old enough. I go to the doctor when I'm well. Suzanne announced a few years ago with our insurance that they're called wellness visits. So I wasn't aware I want to go to the doctor for I'm well. Well, insurance companies, they want you to go when you're well so that they can avert maybe when getting sick or something. And you know the dread. I got, I got to look forward to it. When I got a wellness visit, I feel bad when I'm going, when I get there, and when I leave. After I've seen the doctor, I don't feel good. I not told me anything I want to hear. <laughs> and you know how it is. The last wellness visit I had was in the wintertime, and so it's cold, so you got to put more clothes on. Well, you know what's coming first. When they finally call your name after you've taken a two-hour nap in the waiting room, you know, your emergency's not their emergency, and they, they get you there early so you can stay late. They like to see you that much. They finally call you out of the, the waiting room, and you get in there. The first thing they're going to do is stop by that little flat metal thing that tells you how tall you are, and you're gonna, they're going to weigh you. And you know how it is. In the wintertime, if I could get away with it, I'd wear shorts and sandals because I've got clothes on, and it's going to be bad enough without clothes on, but they won't let me do that. And I'm thinking, oh no, you know how it is. I used to think, I know it's not that bad doc because I got winter clothes on. I got a jacket, I got a windbreaker on, I got all these clothes on. You know how big my feet are, look at these shoes, they weigh five pounds. I said, at least 10 pounds is what I'm wearing. I did a little research, sad I must say. Did a little research on the, on the World Wide Web and this is how much your clothes and shoes weigh when you go to the two to three pounds. Well, I believe by nature I'm an encourager. You might not think so when I'm preaching, but I like to encourage folks. I, I just want to make you feel better. I want you to think positive the next time you go to the doctor and just think this way. Now, see, don't you feel better? <laughs> huh? 
Yeah. 10 pounds ended up being two or three. I want to remind you, Genesis 2.25 says they were naked and they felt no shame. There was nothing at the beginning. Secondly, there was nothing between them. Uh, for your consideration today, for intimacy, if you're truly going to be intimate with someone, whether it's a human being or with God, you got to have nothing between you. How about that? It's not true intimacy when in the back of your mind, you know a lot of stuff's going on and you're not really there in the capacity you need to. You want true love, whether it's with other individuals or with, with family or with God himself, there's got to be nothing between you. What is a true friendship really like? It's when there's nothing between you. And even in a true friendship and all other relationships, you choose not to hold it. You choose to let it go. You choose to give them a second chance. You choose to look beyond stuff. <laughs> you choose not to let anything get between you and the other and that great relationship that you desire. I love the saying, and you've heard me say it often from this platform, I love an existence where you can have nothing between your soul and your Savior. Where you can be forgiven and live in such a way that there's absolutely nothing between. You say, Brother Jay, is that the case all the time? No, but it's the best case when it's that way. And you got to deal with it when everything is not right. You got to get it right with God. And I used to think, wouldn't it be great sometime if God was wrong? But the older I get, I realize one of the greatest attributes of God is he's the same today as he was yesterday. He can't sin, nor is he sin, nor can he cause other people to sin. That's not within his personality to do that or, or being. He's the same. And it feels great when there's nothing between my soul and my Savior. I want to show you a verse that really sums this up in Galatians 2, verses 15 and 16. It says, we are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. I love that verse. And yet, because, and yet because we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we ourselves have believed in Christ Jesus. This was so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no human being will be justified. There are people that believe, well, when I stand in front of God, if the, if the lady of mercy, if I've done more right in my life than I've done wrong, then it's going to be okay with God. That is a lie straight out of the pit of hell, and we need to understand that today. There's no way you and I can be justified in a holy God's sight and his nature and who he is outside of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Works are good, but works are just a manifestation and evidence that I know him and I've been justified. Listen, I saw this years and years ago. It's not original with me, but I sure love it. And then somebody said, and we have big words like that, like regeneration and sanctification. And another big word we have out there in theology and doctrine is justification. Someone said, well, you know what justification means? I have no idea. And I heard this years ago, and it works for me. To be justified, I want to show it to you, means it's just as if I'd never sinned. Just if I'd never sinned. To be justified in God means I took God at his offer. The blood of Jesus Christ has been applied. And when God looks at me, though I have had a life of sin and disobedience, and I've walked away from God and hadn't lived like I need to, when God makes me right and he forgives me and cleanses me, it's just if I'd never sinned. That's how God views it. It's pretty neat. Let me give you two more when I think about no shame. Thirdly, it's nothing belonging. We do have an issue in the world that we live in. It's called ownership. <laughs> it's mine. It's mine. I always reference the nursery. I'm probably, I guarantee you, Miss Amanda's had to deal with that this morning. A child in the nursery, a little toddler got a hold of a toy, you know, and let me tell you, if you think your kids didn't do it, you're living in a dream world because we were born in that. We're born in this thing that it's mine, it's mine. But yet God comes along and he doesn't call us owner. We don't own it. We're actually stewards of everything that God gave us. Hmm. It's just a true relationship. It's nothing belonging. It's nothing that you can do for me. It's not a fashion statement. It's not putting on pride or being haughty. Here's what it is. When you think about Adam and Eve, they were just right with God and they were right with each other. Now, this is before sin. This is before temptation. We'll get into all that in the weeks to come. But they were just naked. There was no shame. Can't imagine. Hmm. I want you to, someone would say, how in the world do we live this way? Well, you got to get over the past. Somebody said it best about the enemy. It just comes in my mind. The next time the enemy talks to you about your past, you need to talk to him about his future. I'm sure he'll leave you alone if you'll do that. There's one thing that we need to remember is today is not the end. Amen. This life is not the end. I've already established it. You're talking about the Genesis issue, how they go together. We've already established that all of us are living souls that are going to live forever. We might not live in the bodily state that we have here, but our spirit and soul is going to live forever somewhere. 
I want to show you a great passage I often think about and put it in for today in Revelation 21, verses 1 through 4. It says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from, from God, prepared like a bride adorned for a husband. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look. Verse number three said, look, God's dwelling is with humanity and he will live with them and they will be his peoples and God himself will be with them and will be their God. Verse number four is it. And he will wipe away every tear from their eye. How many tears? Every tear. Death will be no more. The other day, and uh, th- it's just a drop in the bucket for what Glenn experiences. But I was looking back over our tenure here. won't tell you how that happened, but uh, I save everything if it can be saved and things like that and go back and reference things. But the other day, for something totally unrelated, I, I ended up in my funeral file <laughs> of all things. And I just thought, wow. And there's some in Georgia the last 12 years since we've been here, many that direction, but just at Lakeshore Church, or extensions of Lakeshore Church, I myself, Glenn's probably double this, I don't know, but a lot more. I myself have participated in over 70 funerals that are affiliated with Lakeshore Church since we've been here as a pastor. That's just here in the church. I'm not talking about just extensions of the church. A lot of heartache. I've already thought about putting this point in today. I've already caught two or three people that their name has come to mind while I'm preaching, and it breaks my heart. And it's that adjustment. But I want to tell you something today. Hmm. There's coming a day where there'll be no more. Isn't that great? Not going to have to put another person in the ground. Not going to have to try to build up somebody's spirits when their spirits have been torn down because of hurt and loss. There's coming a day. There's going to be no more. Amen? Amen. I said amen. Amen. Are y'all with me today? We can get excited. Just hold on to me. There's coming a day. Hmm. No more, no more tears and no more sorrow and no more pain and no more death. Hmm. For the former things are going to be taken care of. Thanks be to the Lord. And I want to remind you there's going to be nothing better than that no shame that was in the Garden of Eden before sin. That's going to be the no shame that we have in heaven forever and ever and ever. Why? Because the blood of Jesus Christ covers all sin. Amen. Here's where we want to go. Um, guys, y'all get ready. What's the goal of all of this? All the scripture that we shared today and these thoughts. <laughs> I found this and I knew the name and I know some of the hymns. But um, Charles Albert Tinley, I found some pictures on the internet. Great hymn writer of the mid to late 1800s and even the first part of the 1900s. He wrote some unbelievable hymns. I found a picture that's got some of them. But doesn't have the one I want to reference. And it's the saying I've already said today. He wrote a, a, a hymn that's entitled, Nothing Between My Soul and My Savior. The goal of the game today, the reason it made the sermon title, the goal of mine and your game when it comes to spiritual things is no shame. No shame whatsoever. <laughs> See, God doesn't bring shame on us. And I want to show it to you biblically, all right? But I want to show you something neat out of the, out of the word today that deals with shame so great. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Watch this. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, (laughs) but that the world through him might be saved. The next time you feel shame and you think, man, God's after me. God ain't after you. The only way God's after you if you're feeling shame is for you to get it right. He's not in the shaming business. He's in the saving business. Amen? And the enemy's the one that comes and tries to shame us and guilt us. No. And I love it. Watch this. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Hmm. See, what condemns us is we know we're not right. That's why we don't want to hear it. You know? Huh. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. (laughs) He's here to save us. She said it this way, Jesus isn't trying to expose you to put shame on you. He's trying to expose the sin that has its chains around you. Good word, isn't it? Not here to shame you today. 
You know what my desire for the next few minutes would be is that every one of us would leave this place in the next 10 or 15 minutes with no shame. Where the enemy hangs out in your life and he beats you up, it's time to get over it, folks. Hmm. If you think you messed up, let me remind you something. You've never messed up enough that the blood of Jesus Christ can't forgive you and cover it. Well, preacher, you don't know. (laughs) I don't need to know. Greater is he that's within me than he that's in the world. But I got in my truck this morning. (laughs) And um, I must have been listening to something. I listen to a lot of talk radio. I might listen to a ball game or something on my XM radio. But I reached up there and I made it out with my eyesight. Knew where it was. I pushed it. And immediately when I pushed it, (laughs) immediately, the song came on. Corey Asbury, I made that out. And I didn't really, the song didn't register with me. I knew that once it started, I knew Daniel had sung it. I knew that the, the, they had done it before. And all of a sudden, the lyrics started in. And when it got to the chorus, the word shame is in the first lyric of the chorus. And I mean, my heart, my heart began to beat real fast. I told Daniel, I confessed. I said, we sung that song in church. And I really never listened to the lyrics. As soon as it got off, forgive me, but I'm riding down the road and I got it on my phone, on my playlist so that I could listen to it over and over coming to church this morning. Some phenomenal lyrics. You know what it deals with? It deals with shame. That we come in the Father's house and we're burdened down with issues and burdened down with life's care and the lyrics say, not in God's house, not in the Father's house. Don't bring your shame up in His room. (laughs) <laughs> now let me warn you church some of you are not going to like the way the beat of this song is others of y'all is not going to be beat enough but I want you to listen to the lyrics this is what I want to do if you got some baggage that junk that the enemy keeps dragging up wouldn't it be great to get shed of that stuff once and for all huh let's get quick let's quit giving credit to Jesus for something he says we can get rid of. Mm. Amen? Let's quit poking our lip out and dragging around because we got issues in our life. How about this? A fresh and a new. How about let's give it to the Lord? Because we're at the Father's house. And the Father's house, there's no room for shame. And if you need covering today, the altar's open. All right? You just worship the Lord. If you want to stand to your feet and worship the Lord, if you want to bow where you are, whatever. But we're in the Father's house. Amen. And uh, they're going to they're gonna do it just like they did it before. Daniel, lead us in worship. Thank you. Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. And my story isn't over, my story's just begun. But failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. But failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. not the end game the journey's where you are you never wanted perfect you just wanted my heart and the story isn't over if the story isn't good the failure's never final when the father's in the room the failure's never final when the father's in the room Check your 
your shame at the door Cause it ain't welcome anymore Ooh, you're in the Father's house yeah. Prodigals come home The helpless find hope The love is on the move in the room, dreams and doors swing wide, the day comes to life, love is on the move, when the Father's in the room, miracles take place, the cynical find faith, love is breaking through, when the Father's in the room, Jericho walls are quaking, Strongholds now are shaking. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. shame at the door cause it ain't welcome anymore Ooh, you're in the Father's house would you stand with us today if you're not already um, let's just end it there I, I want to say one more time any shame, any regret, any mess up, anything that the enemy likes to drag up, not in the Father's house. You hear me? Mm. Why? Because I'm a child of God. God doesn't operate that way. That's a misconception right out that people take the Word of God and totally abuse it. Not in the Father's house. And I just, I, I want to I proclaim peace today in your life. Quit shopping there. Quit hanging out there. Quit thinking there. Quit living there. Mm, he didn't save us to the guttermost. He saved us to the uttermost. Amen? So quit hanging out there. That's my encouragement to you. I don't have anybody in mind, but I have all of us in mind, including Jay. All right? And uh, just receive it today. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, all of you, for, uh, for leading us today. What a crescendo. What an ending.